Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Winning in the Dark, Defending Serverless Infrastructure in the Cloud. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Eric Johnson, Principal SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Eric. All right, thank you, Carol. Hopefully everybody can see the slides and hear me okay and the screen share and all that stuff is good to go. So um, welcome. Uh, thank you for attending this morning. I know it's right out of the gate here on what a Wednesday morning. Um, I'm excited to present this talk to you, Winning in the Dark, Defending Serverless Infrastructure. This is a talk, uh, it's, it's a replay or an encore, if you will, of a talk I gave at RSA back in February. So it'll be a different variety of it. I've kind of cleaned some things up since then. Also, hopefully with our longer format, I'll have some time to do some video demos and things like that. So we will jump into that here pretty quick. One thing I do want to mention before we get started is that Brandon Evans and I have been working tirelessly on a new course. SEC 510 is the title. And we are going to do kind of an early three-day preview of this course, uh, tentatively scheduling it for August 17th through August 20th. This is not published anywhere right now. I just found this out yesterday. The course webpage is up. So if you head out to sans.org slash sec 510, you can see kind of the syllabus and some of the topics that we're going to be covering in that course, but it's really all geared around understanding all of the key infrastructure and platform as a service offerings within all three of the major clouds. So GCP, Azure, AWS, they'll all be covered equally in that course. And our overall goal is to give security auditors and cloud engineers and maybe uh, just security professionals a view of the different assessment and defense techniques across all of those services. So this talk today, Defending Serverless Infrastructure, is a small introduction into what will eventually be a nice little hour and a half long segment comparing the serverless infrastructure offerings inside of all three clouds. So this flow that you'll see today and some of the demos will be very similar across VPCs and virtual machines and credential management and IAM and a lot of those key services that you'll run into in all three of those clouds. If you are interested in the early preview beta, uh, they are offering that as a 50% discount. There will be limited seating. So the way that SANS betas work is you will roughly cap, those will cap at 10, like 15 to 20 people is my guess. So if you're interested in jumping into that, because I just found out yesterday and you got up early to hang out with me on this webcast, if you email me at ejohnson at sans.org, I can get you access when the registration becomes available to the early access link. So you can register ahead of the rest of the world actually seeing that. So shoot me an email and I'll put you in touch with the right folks if you want to jump in and get access to that early. Okay, that said, let's jump into serverless infrastructure. So this is in, let's just say a more modern development environment in the cloud. The interesting piece here is it's a horrible name. So and we're all in InfoSec probably for the most part and we know that we suck at naming things Serverless is no different, so let's start with that. There are servers being used here. They're actually cloud-based servers, so the reason it kind of gets its name is because we're gonna write some code, and that code is gonna be side-loaded into an execution environment. So that's gonna live on the cloud, on demand, essentially. And when you write your function, you publish it, it goes into either Lambda or Azure or GCP, and that code will sit there until it's triggered by some sort of event. 
And when that event happens, that code is going to be run inside of a little micro VM or a container, depending on what execution environment you're sitting in, and it'll execute your code. And then when the execution is done, that process will stop. And then it's supposed to die and go away. So overall, that's how serverless infrastructure is set up in the different cloud providers. AWS Lambda is probably the largest offering just because it's AWS and it's been around for a while, but we've also got Azure functions and GCP functions. Our goals for this discussion are to look at it from a security perspective. So what's the benefit here? And what do we need to be worried about? So on our agenda, we're gonna kind of take a red team versus blue team approach. And what we'll do is first look at what the red team might be doing. We're gonna reverse engineer these environments. We're going to look at how secrets management is being done. We'll look at potentially like what the execution roles, where are credential execution roles being stored. And then we'll start to look at the audit logging, the traffic flow, and how we can start to lock down the default execution environments a little bit. So it's a pretty action packed 40 to 50 minutes coming up. Hopefully you'll learn some cool things about serverless that maybe you didn't know ahead of time. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have a few minutes to go through some Q&A and potentially answer some questions. So let's jump into the execution environment. What do these things actually look like? Where is your code running at? In order to attack them, we kind of need to know what user is our function running as, what operating system is it on, what is the default directory? Where's your source code sitting? Which environment variables are there? Where are these credentials stored at? Can you write to the file system? These are the sorts of things that we set out to attack first and foremost as we started the research project. What Brandon Evans and I did was we first started with the fact that, well, we need a shell into all these functions. And by default, you don't really have that. So the first thing we did was we started an open source repository. Now, if any of you have followed some of our research in Puma Security, we've got a, a vulnerable, more web API application called Puma Prey, which is for testing static analysis rules. So of course, we spun up a new repository called Serverless Prey. Inside of that repo, We've got some scripts, we've got some Terraform code, and that will help you automate three functions. We've got a function called Cheetah, Cougar, and Panther, just little kittens, and those will launch three functions into Google, Azure, and AWS. But these are kind of special functions. These are not secure. What they're emulating is having some sort of command injection issue inside of that function, which then allows us to establish a reverse shell inside of that function. It's worth noting that repo has all the documentation, all the commands, all the steps, everything that you're gonna see in this presentation today is in that open source repo. So go check that out. You can clone it. You can have all of these demos kind of up and running in your own personal cloud playground environment within five or 10 minutes. So the way that works is once you deploy it, so you've got these functions out in the world, we're actually setting them up with HTTP based triggers. So you can invoke them from a curl command. We've got two parameters, which host is your listener on and what port is your listener connected or listening to. And then what you can do is invoke that and your function will give you a reverse shell back to wherever your netcat listener is running. So in the example on the slide, I'm invoking, this one is the Google function. And then I've got a little AWS EC2 instance that's just running netcat listening on port 1042. And you can see that I've got a connection and now I can start to interrogate the operating system a little bit. So each function will do that for you. I'll show you some demos and some videos and things that we'll do with the serverless function in order to get information and test these environments out. It's important to realize that the default state 
of all of these functions is not very well documented inside of the cloud providers. When you spin a function up, you were opting into a number of things and our goal was to tell you what you're opting into and then tell you what you can potentially change inside of those environments. So let's look at the default network configuration first. When you spin up a function, such as the Cheetah one I just showed you, the reason that reverse shell connection is working is because all of them out of the box have full access to the internet. They are sitting in a virtual private cloud. You've got your function running. It's got an internet gateway. And that internet gateway has full egress out to the outside world. So that's what you're going to see by default unless you do something to stop it. Now, there really is no traffic logging. You've got some API logging we'll get into. If you're communicating, which on the, as you go around this slide a little bit, you've got the internet and then over the internet, you can start talking to the normal cloud services that are even in your account, like storage or secrets, et cetera. So that's the default execution environment as far as networking goes. What about the container itself, the container that this function is running in? Inside of our environment, so we spun up a, several different ones just to get some variety. So in AWS, we're launching a Node.js 12 function out there. That ends up running in an Amazon Linux 2-based micro VM. The directory that your code is sitting in is in, or the default directory that you are in is slash var slash task. In the user you're executing as is it just a randomly generated SBX user and some number. So that's what you're looking at from the AWS side. In Azure, we actually got two options. There's a Windows and a Linux-based option. We are in the Linux-based option. There's documentation out in the serverless Prey repo that talks about Windows and what that looks like, but that's not in the slide. You can go kind of read about that one. We're launching a .NET Core 3 function out there. You end up in a Debian-based Linux OS. Your default directory is just slash. You're just sitting right there in the root. In the user is app. Over at Google, we're launching a Go function. It's an Ubuntu-based container that you're in. You are in the slash SRV files directory. And interestingly enough, if I could highlight one in red on this slide, in the Google function, you're running as root inside of that container. So that's kind of the execution environment for your function code at least. As you start to look at digging around and finding things. The first question I had from a red team perspective is, where's the source code? Because as you maybe compromise one of these function environments, you probably just want to read the code and see what the function is doing. These functions, really all they are are pass-throughs to other services. Normally it's going to be a function that reads something from a bucket or maybe connects to a database to do read and write operations. So if you can evaluate or read through the source code, you can see what the function is doing. That gives you intel on what it has access to, what secrets might be involved, et cetera. So it's important to know where's the code. Now in AWS, var task, that default directory, that's where the code is. In Azure, it's at home site www root. So a little bit of reference to kind of the IIS world uh, for any of you that have worked in Windows and IIS before. So that'll sound very familiar. In GCP, it's at SRV files. So the first thing I do is I'll go in there and check out the source code, see if you can read it, see if you can get access to it, maybe extract it out of the environment using your command and control reverse shell channel. So here's a basic example. So this is us, we're in the Google execution environment. So we're inside of our little netcat listener and we can just do an LS on the SRV files directory and boom. Now you can see we've got a make file, a go file. We've got a little package.json file for feeding in some configuration data into the function. And then our serverless YAML file, that is part of the serverless framework. If those of you that maybe have not heard that before, that is a framework that makes it really, really simple to write functions and deploy them and version them across all three of the cloud providers. So lots of good config data will live in those source code directories. 
your next step if you're trying to compromise the environment? Well, let's look at the package.json or the cheetah.yaml file, whatever it is, and suddenly, oh look, there's a database connection string. That's feeding the function so it can store data in some sort of database, and suddenly, now you're trying to pivot into that database. So look at the source code, look at the config files, that's going to get you access to things. The next thing that I will do is look in the environment variables because in the different cloud providers, some of them have some pretty awesome secrets stored in environment variables. Now it's worth noting, command injection obviously gets you access to this, but you can also access this through just local file inclusion vulnerabilities as well. So if you see a function downloading a file from an S3 bucket, for example, and you have full control over that file read, maybe we can change that to slash proc slash self slash environ, and then we can get those environment variables back. So I'm showing you the Azure, some of them, there's a ton actually in Azure. Some of the interesting ones is there's encryption keys in their environment variables. From what I can tell, and based on some of their documentation, these website auth and container encryption keys, those are used mainly to protect some of the, uh, they generate like a random API key, for example, to invoke the function. So now you can potentially decrypt and get access to those values. There's a full storage connection string inside of their environment variables for Azure storage. And that's because the execution environment needs the ability to read your source code package. The deployment packages are stored in an Azure storage blob and it needs to pull that down. So that's another thing you'll find in there. There's also App Insights, which is a telemetry kind of audit logging service inside of Azure. The instrumentation key is in there. So suddenly now as an attacker, you can start firing off fake invocation data into App Insights or even read some of that App Insights information as well. So that's another cool one. I'll get into the MSI secret here in a little bit, but that has to do with their managed identity. In Google, if you were to look through our documentation and check out what Google is up to, Google, their environment is actually pretty clean. So there's not a whole lot that I found in Google's environment variables that were interesting to me. AWS, I'll show you a slide here in a little bit, actually stores another set of credentials inside of their environment variables. So in AWS and Azure, a lot of good information in here. And we'll take a look here in a few at what you can start to do with these pieces of information. Okay, so let's talk about the execution roles. So to avoid hard coding things in those YAML files or in your source code, like the database connection string or the connection string to the Azure storage blob, they all give you the ability to set up what they call an execution role. And what that role is, is a way for you to create a service account in the Google world or a managed identity in the Azure world or an execution role in AWS. But this is an account you can set up you can provision it with permissions to read from storage or read from the key vault or connect to the database. And then when the function comes to life, it is assigned that role with those permissions. This is when you're going to start to see maybe more limited sets of secrets in the source code and in those config files because now we're kind of outsourcing this option to the cloud provider. So the next step in our red team pivot is to figure out in each cloud provider, where are those credentials? If they're not customer managed, they're cloud managed. So we need to find out where those are. One very interesting note is when you turn this on, AWS and Azure, they will create this little role or managed identity for you and those items, have very few permissions by default. In AWS, if you just click through the interface, it'll give you rights to maybe write some logging data into CloudWatch logs, and that's about it. 
Azure has App Insights. I just showed you the environment variable key to do that. But again, that's about it. So telemetry is about all you get out of the box with those two. You've got to go add and customize permissions in order to get access to anything else. In Google, when you create a function, if you just click through and accept all of the defaults, you are automatically getting your function put into this editor role. The editor role is a very powerful role out of the box. It's got pretty much full read access to all of the existing resources in the project. So your function, you might only need access to one storage bucket and maybe even one directory inside of that storage bucket. And suddenly you are running in a very elevated permissions environment because your function, if you just use the default editor role, has full read and write access to storage buckets inside of that account. It is also interesting. Now, one thing that's good, it's a good feature, is that Secrets Manager in Google does require some additional permissions in order for the function to access that. So it seems to be somewhat inconsistent across all the services. Just realize you probably need to, in order to lock this function down from a permissions perspective, create your own service account with appropriately scoped and narrowly defined permissions to meet your function's requirements. If you take the default, you are opting into a pretty excessive permission scenario. So we'll look at an example here in a minute, but when you spin up these functions with those service accounts, where are the credentials? Now I already gave AWS's away because I told you, just dump the environment variables, you'll find a secret access key, you will find the token and also the secret value in there, and that's it. That's all you need to use them and start accessing the cloud environment as that function. Azure's and Google's are, are managed much better. Google's is in the instance metadata service, which is very well documented, so you can pull those out. Azure's is actually, in my opinion, the most well-managed because you need a couple of pieces of information in order to get the credentials out. So we're gonna look at Azure's scenario. Now, all of these are in our documentation in the serverless prey project. If you're interested in one, just go check that out over there. But in Azure, it's kind of a two-step process. So in order to grab the creds from Azure functions, the first thing, you're going to need that local file inclusion vulnerability to get the environment variables because the endpoint that will give you a token is in two environment variables. One is the MSI endpoint. That gives you the HTTP-based path. So you can see it on the slide on line three where it's local host port 8081 slash MSI slash token. It's worth noting that can be different. In Windows, it was on port like 4024 or something like that. So you need that environment variable to know where the token is. And then you also need line four, which is the MSI secret. The combination of both of those, as you can see on the bottom part of the slide, lets me run a curl request and you have to set the secret header and then curl that endpoint. Another important piece of this is line three, which is the resource. The resource actually is the scope of the JWT that you're going to get back. So this is a pretty powerful feature as well because it means that this token, once we finally run that and we get it, you're gonna get back this JSON web token. And if you decode that JSON web token, what you'll find out is that the audience is scoped to just storage.azure.com. This stolen web token all of a sudden cannot be used against the vaults or against the database service or whatever. So you've got to go steal a bunch of different tokens to get them scoped globally enough to actually pivot through the cloud. So these JWTs are making your life a little bit harder, which is a good thing from a blue team perspective, but that's the scenario you've got to go through with Azure versus AWS where you just dump the environment variables and you've got access to the full cloud policy that that execution role is running under. 
So let's take a look at what this can look like. Now I'll do a demo here and it's just a video, but we're gonna take a look at that scenario, except we'll use GCP. So you'll get to see how you'll maybe can extract data from the GCP metadata service. So we'll do just a different variety in a different cloud here. But you can see in this video, so I'm starting up my Netcat listener. And then what we'll do is run that request. So you can see we've got command and control at this point. We're gonna query the metadata service. Now we're gonna list the service accounts and I wanna query the default service account because that's what the function is running under. One interesting section of this would be scopes. So these are the services that you have access to from a scoping perspective. And it's really overscoped out of the box. Cloud platform is really all we need, but you can see I've got Google contacts, drives, spreadsheets, all sorts of extra scopes in there that this token that we're about to dump has access to. So here's our token coming out of the metadata endpoint. We've officially stolen the token now. And now we can just start communicating with the REST API directly. So what I'm doing here is using that token to list all of the different storage buckets inside of the GCP account. And you can see I've got one in there, the Cheetah bucket, that's something that our stack will create. And what we can do now is say, hey, let's list all of the objects in that storage bucket. So we're starting to interrogate the GCP environment using this function's credential. We've got access to everything the function does, except I'm on my laptop here in Iowa, not inside of one of GCP's data centers. The final piece is, well, okay, we've got the list of objects. Let's download it. So we'll go ahead and download this image Again, we've got to put that bearer token in there in order to start pulling data out of the cloud and exfiltrating. And eventually you can see there's the image coming back and you, know, you can see the standard kind of just image text or whatever. So that's an example of taking a Google token from the metadata service and then using that to extract and steal data from a bucket. I'm now just showing off, right? We're gonna dump some secrets from their secrets manager. Again, let's list the secrets that the function has rights to in this project. You can see we've got one, which is our database password. So we've gotten smarter, right? We moved it out of the YAML file. We put it in the secrets manager thinking that'll save us, right? But the function needs access to read that on startup, which means our stolen token, when we go to retrieve that can grab that data as well. So of course we'll decode it. We'll see what the real, this comes back as base 64. And then I base 64 encoded it for storage. And eventually we get back to our super secret password of, but unicorns apparently do exist. So that's an example of credential compromise in GCP using command injection to extract that token from the environment. So let's flip back to our slides here. So that's what essentially exfiltration looks like. So I just showed you using the GCP REST API to do that. Azure's is very similar, and I already showed you the MSI calls to get that JWT and use that. AWS's is a lot more simple. So we've got those examples on these slides. When you dump ENV or uh, they cap the local environment variables. You're gonna see these three values, session token, secret access key, and access key ID. So all you have to do is just export those three environment variables and then the command line interface for AWS will just authenticate with them. So from there, you just need to run something like AWS S3 copy, and this is copying that same image that I just showed you in Burp using the REST API in Google. This is what's going to download it from the Amazon S3 bucket. So it's a lot easier. If you know the AWS CLI really well, you can leverage stolen credentials and jump in and start using normal commands. It's a little more difficult in Azure and GCP because you're gonna have to piece together some REST calls. There are some maybe more tricky ways to do this using the CLIs for Azure and GCP. For example, you can edit your local 
JSON files and try to put the stolen credentials in there. Um, Cat Traxler gave a webcast about a month ago, I would say, on uh, credential pivoting in GCP, and she actually opened up a little uh, MySQL, I don't think it was MySQL, it's like the local SQL, um, SQL database editor and tried to paste in her stolen credential in the local DB file. So there are other ways you can do this, but the whole idea is, is that these creds are very usable if you know where to put them and you can just communicate directly with the API on behalf of that function. So our next benchmark, pretend you've stolen keys. You're on the red team. How long do you have before they expire? Now it's really entertaining to me because these functions are really supposed to only live for like on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, right? But yet the creds, if you start at the top in Amazon, for example, AWS Lambda credentials live for 12 hours out of the box. So if you dump those environment variables like I just showed you, you can use those for 12 hours before they expire. And this is not configurable. This isn't part of the platform. You can't control this. If it was me, I'd probably scope them down to an hour or something like that. Why not rotate them more frequently? But as a customer, we can't change that. That's just the way the platform works. Azure functions are a little bit shorter. Those are you know, on the order of eight hours that those are valid for. And then you've got GCP functions, which kind of are locked down. Now they run as root in the container, but yet their tokens expire in roughly 30 minutes. So they're doing a much better job of rotating those tokens more frequently to avoid, if they get leaked, having them be long lived values that attackers can use for a while. So that is the snapshot of how long stolen credentials live for. Another very common example is persistence of what you might do as a red teamer. If you have full control of this environment, command and control, you might wanna to try to put malware into that execution environment. And in theory, this thing should just go away, right? It should just be gone. As soon as the function ends, that file should go away. But because of performance reasons, unfortunately, the cloud providers keep them in a warm state is what they're called. So the first time you execute a function, it might take five, 600 milliseconds to get the code loaded into the micro VM, get the micro VM up off the ground, and then have that thing execute. But then you run it again and it takes 90 milliseconds. And that's because the warm environment was kept around. So suddenly what was supposed to be stateless is now a very persistent environment. So out of the box, in AWS, they've got their environment locked down the best. The temp directory is kind of the only place that you can actually store things. So if you try to write malware into the temp directory, it's gonna work. With Google and Azure, the source code directory is read only. You can't write that. So the example on the slide is showing me trying to write a malware shell script into a GCP SRV files directory and I get access denied, but I can flip right around and write it to the root directory. I can write it to slash temp slash malware. And you can see me putting the ICAR, you know, kind of malware test sample right there on the container OS inside of your function environment. No cloud provider cared. The function environment stayed alive. It did not operate any differently with this malware inside of it. And then at this point you're asking, how long does it live for? In reality, how long do these warm environments actually stick around? So in AWS, you're about 11 minutes or so that that malware will live in the environment for before, and this is with no activity. So it's gotta be clean, like no requests coming in. If you're in a very high volume function that gets executed every minute, it's gonna live for a lot longer. But if you've got 11 minutes of inactivity in there, it finally does recycle the environment and the malware goes away. Azure's about half that, about six minutes on Azure. Again, GCP, about three minutes, will recycle the execution environment and those will drop off. 
So that's what persistence looks like inside of the environment. So how are we feeling on the red team side? Hopefully I've given you lots of ideas for compromising functions. You can launch our serverless prey apps and kind of play with a lot of those things. The biggest takeaway up to this point is that really nothing I've described, the token life, the malware persistence, how long the warm environments stick around for, none of that is controllable by you, the customer. This is a lot of magic going on inside of the platform that you kind of just are not told about. It's not very well documented. So we shift our tactics to blue team here. Let's talk about maybe how we can start to detect some of these things, what log files are available, and then maybe how we can lock down some of our networking. So what I wanna do next, we'll take another break here, and we'll take a look at the, this is on the Azure side. Now this is using diagnostic data to actually look at some log information and see if we can detect those compromised credentials. So if I steal them from the function, what evidence do you have to detect and then react from a blue team perspective? So let me go ahead and get that video going. There's Azure. And let's kind of walk through this one together. So I've got some commands stored in the shell just so you don't have to watch me type things. But this is running an app insights query looking for function invocations. So how many times is my function actually executing? So I've got some audit log data in the function itself that says insert an event ID of eight every time the function runs. Now what I know is that I am querying the key vault for a secret on every execution. So you would expect the number of executions to be equal to the number of reads against that secret. So we've got nine function invocations that are showing up here. And now I'm looking for how many reads are against that secret. And we're gonna see something kind of alarming here. There's 13 reads against the secret. So now I know that the function has only ran nine times, but there are four additional secret reads that need to be looked into so now we're looking directly at the list of those secret reads. Let's take a look at who else is grabbing this thing. So as we scroll through the diagnostic log data, we can see here's a normal secret read. That's an IP address coming out of Azure. You can see that it's using the AZ SDK net user agent to connect to it. So that's pretty normal. But if we scroll up a little bit, Suddenly now I've got an IP address that's not inside of Azure's IP space. And it was successful at reading it and notice no user agent was put in there. So immediately we're thinking from a blue team perspective, something bad is going on, right? Because we've got a function, credentials from a function, reading secrets, but it's not coming from inside of Azure. So that tells you right away that you probably have had some credentials compromised. So these audit logging records are kind of your first defense in figuring out if bad things are going on. So in AWS Lambda, all of these events are gonna be in CloudTrail. When your function reads a secret or grabs something from storage, you need to go into CloudTrail and start analyzing those data events. I just showed you in the video Azure Monitor, and this is difficult, and I'll explain a little bit about that here in a bit, but overall the Azure Monitoring Service and Diagnostic Service, that's where you're going to see that sort of audit log data. In GCP, it's in the IAM audit logs. So they all offer this. Here's the query that I showed you in the video and a little more readable version of it, but this is us looking for Azure Diagnostics from the key vaults. You can see the resource provider there on line two, and we're saying, look, I only want reads on that Cougar database password, and you can see the list. So you've got some secret gets, you've got some secret versions, you can see the caller IP addresses, and notice we've got two from 20 dot, that's the Azure IP, and then two, three from 95 dot. Those are all 
stolen credential records from when I demoed the uh, video environment. So the audit log data is there, but we need to start actually automating that a little bit. So Will Bingston has a nice little project out on the Netflix Skunk Flicks organization in GitHub. So if you haven't seen that, and maybe I can throw that in the chat at the very end if you haven't seen it before, but it's essentially, it's part of his blog post on detecting credential compromise in AWS. Now that's very heavily based on CloudTrail and looking for these user IDs, the function IDs or instance IDs on the VM side, doing things. And then suddenly that same user ID is invoked from some other IP around the world. So that is essentially what you need to start thinking about on the Azure and the GCP side. I'm not aware of any projects that are trying to automate that like AWS is doing, at least at this point in time. So if you're aware of some, throw them in the Q&A, let me know, I'd love to check them out. But this is a start, we've got the data. The interesting part on Azure specifically is that out of the box, your Azure Key Vault doesn't give you this information. You have to go do something in order to make that happen. So this gets kind of challenging. Now on the front page of Azure Security Center, it was yelling at me and saying, hey, Eric, go turn this on, but you've got to remember to go do that. The other challenge I ran into is Azure Storage does not integrate into Azure Diagnostics very well. Their data is in an XML format and that doesn't natively import into this very JSON focused environment. So they've got a ticket open that was supposed to be done in Q2 of this year. I'm not positive if that has or has not been fixed yet, but I had zero intel on me stealing storage objects using those stolen credentials. So when you dig into the data, here's really some of the signatures you're looking for. Obviously we've got an IP address that belongs to Azure. We've got the right user agent. And then now I'm seeing, oh, well, there's not an Azure IP address. And then we've got a curl user agent saying, hey, Eric is just running curl from the terminal somewhere. So those are the first bits of information that you should be looking for in your kind of serverless defense programs. So let's take a look at the next option, which is our function network access controls. So I told you earlier that you essentially have full egress out to the world. You can connect to the entire internet. That's the default. The question here is, can you lock this down a little bit? So we'll play a few minutes of this video here, and I'm just gonna show you what we can do. So this is me in AWS, and I'm setting up this Netcat listener on port 1042. So let me go ahead and spin up this Netcat listener and notice when I invoke our command and control, we're suddenly getting a timeout. I'm not getting my connection in. So I'm trying to run ID and who am I and some of those commands and my function now is, is not talking back to me. The way that we did that is by locking down our network access a little bit. So let me pause this video here for a moment and we'll get into some of the controls that are actually making that happen. So what you just saw was me putting a function inside of my own customer managed virtual private cloud. Instead of using the default network, we're gonna to start to control this a little bit. We've got a VNet integration option with Azure the downside with this is that you can take your functions in Azure and put them in your own VNet, which has flow logging and network security groups turned on, but you've got to upgrade to the premium Azure app service offering in order to get that option. So you've got to pay a little bit more. The other downside is that that premium plan, all it really does is it puts your function inside of a server that's running all the time. So you remember that whole persistence problem we talked about? We suddenly have lost all concept of that malware going away because it's always going to be available. 
your response time will be really good, but now that function is just online 100% of the time. And then GCP functions, it has a serverless VPC cloud access integration, but in my experience, that's really giving your function access to VPC resources. It's not really mounting the function with a network interface inside of the VPC. So in my opinion, that one's not really apples to apples. So once you get your network integration set up, we are completely blocked. I mean, we have shielded this thing from the outside world. So I've updated that diagram that I showed you very early on to give you some info on what it looks like. So the first time I threw this function into this network, I had no access to the internet. So nothing, I cannot talk outbound whatsoever. You've got to fix that if you need outbound access. You also cannot talk to any APIs for AWS because those require outbound access. So you are going to need to set up a NAT gateway with access to the internet in order to talk to the CloudWatch API, for example, or you're going to have to enable private cloud endpoints. So those are the two things we'll kind of look through and those are in our serverless prey repo, if that's something you wanna play with, but you are now fully responsible for your network flow. So to turn on the VPC integration, number one, you need to set up a security group and a couple of private subnets for the function to, to live in. The private subnets determine what outbound internet access it's got through an internet gateway. You've also got the security group, which will give you traffic flow filtering. So by default in AWS, your default security group is gonna give you nothing's coming in, but everything can go out. So you have full egress again. Network security groups in Azure, they'll operate similarly as well as the GCP firewall rules. So if you wanna start locking things down from an egress perspective, we need to create our own security group that maybe restricts some of that traffic flow. Now you can restrict them by site or block. You can also filter them by TCP ports, et cetera. So what I just showed you in the video, remember I was trying to get command and control out on that 1042 port. Now what that was timing out with is the fact that I had put in place this security group rule that is filtering traffic on port 443 from an egress perspective. So as a good attacker, I'm blocked on port 1042, but guess what port we're going to switch to when we finish that example off? We'll just start exfiltrating over port 443 because we know the function probably needs access to the CloudWatch API, which is out on 443, but it's a start. We're starting to lock down those ports. The next step in the network monitoring bit is turning on flow logging in these custom VPCs so we can actually see accept and reject traffic. So we will enable flow logging inside of our functions network, and then we can start to get more detective controls. So in order to do that, we'll add this flow log resource, and we've got to give it permissions to write into the log group, and notice I'm attaching this to the Lambda VPC on line six, and then I'm setting it up to capture the reject traffic on line eight. So this is going to give us some traffic flow information, and this is a query that we can kind of take a look at in the final video of me searching CloudWatch, and I'm looking for that 1042 port. And notice, because I'm making an attempt with my reverse shell to talk over 1042, I'm suddenly getting some entries in here, rejects, and we've got now some detective control on that function, doing things it probably should not be doing. The final piece to locking this down has to do with creating private service endpoints. Now I've mentioned a few times that the CloudWatch API, you have to talk over 443 across the internet to get to that API and get your telemetry data into CloudWatch. Private service endpoints 
in Azure Private Endpoints. Google, I have not found something comparable to this yet at this point that works for serverless functions. Again, if you're aware of something that does work, please let me know. Essentially, blocks off public access to those cloud endpoints. So you're gonna create a private cloud endpoint. You're gonna add a route straight from your functions private subnet into the storage and the secrets and the CloudWatch APIs, et cetera. And now you know your function can talk internally to these resources. And all we do at that point is then start blocking the outside world from communicating with those super sensitive ones, which will effectively eliminate that stolen credential attack. So the way to do that is just a little more configuration in our function. Again, this is in our serverless prey repo, but we're gonna, this is an example of an S3 endpoint. So our super important pictures of our baby cats, we're going to set up a route from our Lambda VPC, that's line 10, and say, please create a private endpoint for me to talk to S3 in US East 1. So now your VPC can talk over this private link to S3 instead of routing out around the entire internet. Once you have that set up and you know your function is communicating internally, this is when you can start to get a little fancy with your resource policies. So this bucket is essentially going to say, look, if you get a request, notice line seven, any request from the Lambda execution role, we can say has to come from the Lambda VPC. That's what the condition on line 11 and 12 does. So at this point, if you steal the creds and you invoke them from your laptop at home, that Lambda execution role is coming from an IP outside of that VPC, and the bucket is going to deny you access to that. And you can see those deny requests here on this slide where we steal some creds, we try it, doesn't work, right? Access denied. And then if I start looking in CloudTrail, I can start seeing those access denied logging events, the external IP address, and the user, the Lambda execution role that attempted to make it from a different spot. So that's really the rest of this video. I'll go ahead and kind of walk you through this. So as we pick up, remember we were trying to connect on 1042. So we've got our evil data sitting in the flow log. Notice we're gonna query that flow log. We're gonna look for any source address starting with 1042. And this is kind of a two part query. You have to start the query and then you have to get the results back. So that's all I'm doing here is grabbing the results of this query. And as we go through, you can see that I've got a reject on the functions network interface, and we can see it's trying to talk out to some 3.12 IP address. So there's the block on port 1042 that's showing up in flow logs now because we were inside of our own managed network where we could turn on that security control. As any good attacker would do, let's start the reverse shell on port 443. So we know that's the outbound egress allowed. So we'll go ahead and make this connection again and we'll steal the creds. So again, to kind of detective uh, egress rules. You all have probably run into this before, like they're a nice defense and depth control, not perfect, right? Because almost everybody has 443 open. We'll grab our tokens and what you're going to see this video do next is actually set the three environment variables to use them from you know the evil attacker terminal so we'll set these three values so it just takes a moment and then we'll try to talk to s3 the cool part is that in this environment i've already got the private endpoint and the bucket policy set up to deny access from outside of the VPC. So as we run this S3 sync command, trying to exfiltrate, notice there's the access denied error. And now we've left an audit trail inside of our cloud trail logs. So the last step to detecting that is I've got my cloud trail log streaming into Athena which essentially turns log data into a SQL query. So you can see I'm just saying select star 
from the cloud trail logs and I'm looking for that Panther dev role. So I'm gonna set the execution ID and finally we'll grab out any of the cloud trail data from the Lambda execution role. We're specifically looking for access denied just to reduce some of the noise. And you can see right here, oh, interesting. So S3 denied access to list the objects from this random IP address that's out there on the internet. And that was all because of the private link and our bucket policy saying it had to be inside of that execution environment. So we've proven that it all works. That kind of wraps up today's serverless kind of attack versus defense session. I've got this slide, it's kind of left over from RSA, which says, you know, if you're new to this, what can you kind of do next? Um, it's all about inventory, scanning for secrets management, getting those audit logs into a centralized location and starting to build up some alerting and monitoring strategies around them. So with that, Couple of acknowledgements. So Gal Bashan's got a great project called Lambda Internals that served as kind of the inspiration for some of the C2 functions that we wrote. Brandon Evans I already mentioned uh, a huge help and a really a great partner on this project, trying to get things all set up and automated so they work correctly. So you can just launch them. Um, let us know if you run into any issues out on that Git repo. And then there's some other good serverless security resources contributed by Pure Second Pratigo that I would highly encourage you to check out if you're kind of new to this space. Okay, so Carol, I think I will pass it back to you at this point and right. open it up for questions. All right, thanks Eric for that great presentation. We do have one ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Eric, please enter it into the questions window now. Uh, this one asks, okay, is there any way to inhibit these things instead of looking for them? And then adds like that. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that means. <laughs> this came um, about, it looks like 14 minutes ago. Okay. So yeah, it sounds like that, that may have came in prior to the private link and the bucket policy that actually starts to shut stuff down. So that's probably about as good as you can do from blocking those compromised credentials. And this is interesting to me, and to my knowledge, the cloud providers, they don't do a very good job of detecting this. If you're using stolen creds, you know, so at RSA, I was sitting next to somebody from Microsoft's Azure Sentinel team, and I was going through the demo and the video and showing it to him, and he was kind of shocked that Sentinel didn't pick this up. So I don't know if they've improved it since then, but it's really hard to detect these creds being used from outside of their environments. Um, maybe, I mean, their IP address spaces are pretty well known. However, nothing stops you from spinning up your own VM inside of Azure and using the creds from there. So you're really, it's just anomaly detection, right? But yeah, as far as I know, no cloud providers natively detect this. Maybe guard duty might in some scenarios, but inconsistent at best would be my answer for that bit. All right, thank you. <clears throat> what attacks have you observed in the wild using Lambda functions and other cloud serverless functions? So <clears throat> attacks from, <laughs> it's kind of a loaded question. Lambda functions are also very convenient for attacking. So <laughs> most of the red team side will say, if I compromise a cloud and I have privileges to stand up or create a new function, suddenly you're now running commands inside of that customer's cloud. So there's that aspect to it. From the defensive side, just writing insecure functions, you know, the same sort of stuff that we've always had. Supply chain attacks where I've got a function that's inheriting from a vulnerable node package, those are still very relevant and that's where a lot of these command injection or event injection style issues will live. Um, that part is a little bit different, uh, but really just application security has never been more a focus here, right? That is the only thing to attack. There's no infrastructure, you know, you don't have to worry about patching. A lot of the traditional network security bits are largely managed by the cloud providers. So I would just say, you know, 
source code, scan, review, you know, kind of write good, smart, defensible code would be the biggest takeaway there. All right, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I see. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.